Good evening, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our Sunday evening lesson. I'm glad that you could be with us and have an opportunity to spend some time in God's Word together. Uh, before we begin, just want to remind some of you of the uh, uh, our prayer list, and particularly uh, some additions that I announced this morning. Uh, that uh, again, we are certainly mindful that a number of our members are are struggling with COVID at this time, uh, and a couple other individuals that we want to be. Uh, mindful of and add to our list that have been affected by COVID. Uh, first of all, Ken Rayburn has requested that we keep him in our prayers um, because he is experiencing COVID at this time. Also, uh, we've been asked uh, by Robin, Robin Goebel to keep uh, her family in our prayers. Uh, Charlie Pride, uh, the country music singer, uh, recently uh, succumbed to COVID. So obviously that uh, family is experiencing loss at this time. So we want to keep them in our prayers as well. Uh, this evening, of course, uh, we're continuing our series that uh, David began a couple of uh, Sundays ago on asking for a friend, and so we'll be continuing that uh, this evening. But at this time, as we focus our attention on our time together, as we approach God's Word, we will begin with a word of prayer. Alan will be leading us in that prayer. Then that will be followed by Jerome with the Scripture. Uh, then we'll have our lesson from David, and then Danny Weddle will close us out with a word of prayer. Let us all go to our Father in prayer at this time, please. Blessed Lord, we come to your throne of glory and we honor you, Father. Honor you for who you are and what you do for us. Father, thank you so much for the many, many blessings you give to us regularly. Thank you, Father, for watching over us, Father, and caring for us. Thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Father, for the salvation that you offer all of us. And we thank you, Father, for your offering and pray that we can do everything we can to present your message to others so that others will know of your salvation and have the opportunity through faith and obedience to accept it. Father, help us as we help you in that endeavor. Father, as Mark has mentioned, a lot of folks on their prayer list that, that need your care that need our attention and father we pray that you bless these individuals those father that are struggling with the covid disease those father that are struggling with other issues it is our sincere prayer father that you bless each and every one of these individuals that are hurting and bless them father that their bodies might heal and they might be back into a regular walk of life Father, bless them and care for them. Bless those, Father, that are hurting, maybe emotionally, maybe spiritually, and help us to assist them as well. Father, we pray for the good things that are going on. We've talked so much about uh, how, how bad things are because of COVID and other issues. But Father, we thank you for the good that's taking place. We thank you for people that have wonderful hearts that are looking to do good for others. Father, as we look around, we're thankful for all those that are assisting our young people. We're thankful, Father, for all those that are, that are assisting our seniors. We're thankful, Father, for all those that are caring for other individuals. Father, we indeed are thankful for our young people here at Washington Avenue and all the things that they do. We're thankful for their parents, and Father, bless them as they continue to teach and, and continue to motivate their young people to do what's good and right. Father, we're thankful for our seniors and we pray that you be with them and help them in every walk of life in which they're involved. And Father, we're thankful for our leadership here at Washington Avenue. We're thankful for our deacons and all that they do. Father, we're thankful for our teaching staff and all that they do throughout the year. Father, we're just so thankful that we have such a strong and faithful fellowship together. And we pray, Father, you bless Washington Avenue and help us to always do what's right and godly. Father, we pray for our Bible study tonight. Pray that David uh, come, uh, comes and we know he's prepared, Father, so help him in his preparations as he presents your message to us tonight. And Father, we pray for uh, all of us that we might have ears that are attuned to what David has to present and help us apply your message into our lives. Again, Father, we thank you for everything but especially, Father, for your Son, who offered his life for us, giving us that salvation that we so, so desperately need. Thank you for your mercy and grace, 
And we offer this prayer through your son's blessed name. Amen. I will be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible, Matthew chapter 4, the verses are 1 through 4. Matthew chapter 4, the verses are 1 through 4. And the Bible says, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And good evening, church. Good evening, friends and family. All of you that are able to worship with us tonight, open up your Bibles and spend time together. We're grateful that you could be here with us tonight. Uh, it is a fantastic time to dive into God's Word. We've been going through a Bible series here recently called Asking for a Friend. And if this is your first time uh, participating in that, then what we're doing is going through and recognizing that sometimes we have questions that we may not feel comfortable asking publicly. And so sometimes we might be tempted to discuss this like, let me ask something, but you know, I'm, I'm asking for a friend. And so we want to cover some of those questions that people might have, but not be so forthcoming in asking them. Uh, and what we want to do is have Bible answers for Christian questions. I was asked recently, this week actually, uh, where do I get the material or what's coming from this? And I'll be real honest with you. These are questions that people have asked me multiple times. Uh, and so I know that they're common and maybe a little more common than we would like to admit which is why we're going through uh, these studies. And what I hope is that these satisfy you and you understand as you spend time in God's Word and you see that the answers these come from the Word, that that's how you can direct your life. Because if we're going to be God's people and if we truly believe in God and understand that He is the Almighty, He is the all-knowing, the ever-present, the most holy God, then we have to put our trust in Him and His Word to direct our lives. There's no greater place we can put it. No one is wiser. No one knows more. No one else has directed the universe such as God. So let us follow after God to the absolute best of our ability. So tonight, we're talking about asking for a friend. Here's the big question. How often should a Christian fast? How often should a Christian fast for religious reasons? Now, i got to tell you, that question comes up quite a bit. And to be honest, most of the time in the, the church of Christ, we don't talk about fasting a tremendous amount. I do not know how often you fast. You do not know how often I fast. I'm not sure we've ever talked about it personally. Maybe a couple of you, maybe. But in the world, and for centuries and centuries and centuries, fasting's been pretty common in our world, in a multitude of religions. You know that the Jewish people certainly fasted for Yom Kippur. They have other uh, fasting holidays, uh, in fact, two major fasting days and four minor uh, fasting days that may be in remembrance of the destruction of the temple or other historical matters for them, such as the, the day of Esther, where they fast to remember the victory that God gave them when Esther would go before the king uh, during her time, and more on that later. We know that those that practice Islam have an entire month of Ramadan dedicated, in which fasting is a principal element of that. We know those that are Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox, and frankly, more and more of some of the Protestant churches practice Lent, in which there's a fast where they cut off something uh, for 40 days. Uh, we know that there's even uh, pagan societies throughout history, like the cult of Asclepius, who was a healing god. And before you would receive teachings from that pagan god, you would have to fast a number of days. Uh, the Evink uh, shaman of Siberia would require fasting in order to receive visions. Uh, in pre-Columbian Peru, there were certain religious groups where if you were going to confess a transgression against your tribe or your people, it would require fasting before you would go before the priest. And some of our great Greek thinkers, from Pythagoras to Hippocrates to Plato, we have historical records where those gentlemen fasted as well. Sometimes for religious reasons, 
and sometimes for health reasons, as Hippocrates was quick to recommend it for health purposes. Now, that's really not where we want to focus tonight, on the health purposes. I know intermittent fasting has been very popular lately, and I know some of you watching tonight have benefited from that. And so that's a different thing than we're talking about. Tonight, we want to focus on, as a Christian, as someone who's interested in pleasing God, who knows that I need to be as devoted to God as possible, who wants to draw closer to God, how often do I need to fast? Let's get our Bibles out. Let's go and see what the Bible has to say. Because fasting, we're primarily talking about cutting off food. And I don't know about where you are, but where I live, food's a very good thing. It's not a matter of just having pancakes. I got to put stuff on those pancakes. It's not a matter of just trying any food, but sometimes let me put figs on cream cheese and bread. I don't know how that's going to taste, but I'm willing to try it. I know that sometimes we have to have our salads. Sometimes we have our fried rices. Sometimes we have a plethora, a bounty of food to enjoy. And you may have had that today for lunch. But with fasting talking about no food and maybe no water for a set period of time for religious reasons to please God. Now, as Jerome read for us earlier, one of the most famous references to fasting in the scriptures occurs in Matthew chapter 4, when our Lord and Savior Jesus is at a critical point in his ministry. He has just been baptized by John the baptizer. And God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit, and the Son are all present. You have that moment where you hear the voice say, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And then in Matthew chapter 4, the Spirit leads him out into the wilderness because he's going to be tempted by the devil. And in preparation for that, we read the Bible tell us that Jesus fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights. And then the devil came. And the Bible says he was hungry. And we're like, yeah, 40 days. I bet you were hungry. And the devil grabbed a hold of that perceived weakness in the human element of Jesus. And he said, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. But of course, you know this story. Jesus is not going to be tricked so easily by the devil. And Jesus knows exactly how to reply to the devil. He's not going to do it. And he says, that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. To be sure, he also resisted the two other temptations of the devil, and he did all of that without once using his divine powers, but simply quoting scriptures and resisting, giving us an example. But it's interesting to us because he prepared for that by fasting. So that already triggers our interest a little bit. Jesus fasted, and it proved to be a very valuable tool. I'm interested in fasting from, from that perspective. As we go a little bit further, let's just skip over one chapter to Matthew chapter 5. You have the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. And the image I have now presented to you is from the Mount of Beatitudes, which is a place where they think maybe Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, regardless, it's a place where people that can travel to, they can sit and they can contemplate the Sermon on the Mount and these incredible teachings of Jesus. And there's value in doing that. But for our purposes tonight, we go to Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, where Jesus actually addresses fasting. And what I would like you to do as you read along in this is pay attention to specifically who he's talking to and how he's talking about the subject of fasting. Words of Jesus. It's got to be important to us. He says, moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. For they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Okay, this is Jesus talking to a group of people, and this is Jesus talking in such a specific way that you can't deny he's talking about fasting. But listen to what he's saying. He qualifies it, and he distinguishes what is unacceptable in fasting and what is acceptable in fasting. And in the midst of that, he's saying it as if fasting is a very normal expectation 
for the people. He tells them, don't fast like the hypocrites. Their objective in fasting is to be seen of men, and so they disfigure their face, and they, they want the appearance, and they want the praise of men. But he says, but you, in verse 17, but you, when you fast, anoint your head with oil and wash your face. Now, in a modern world, that may seem a little confusing to us because these aren't normal practices for us. But in the first century, if you were a person during that time, it would not have been uncommon for you to have good grooming and hygiene uh, habits of anointing your head with oil. There may have even been some sort of perfume in the oil and the washing of your face. These were things that you did to present yourself well before others. And the reason Jesus said that is he said, you're not fasting so that you can show off how spiritual you are to the world around you and draw the attention to yourself and make this about pride and ego and yourself and look how I per, uh, perform these rituals. He says, the fasting that you're doing is between you and God. Direct that between you and God in secret. So we now have an example of Jesus who fasted, and it was very powerful. And now we have a teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, where he's talking about fasting, but this is helping us generate some questions because it, it begs questions, doesn't it? Well, where does that come from? And why was he speaking to that audience at that time about that subject is, is, is an expectation. There's got to be some history there. And is there a specific command where we must fast? That's a reasonable question. So let's go back to our Old Testament. These were Jewish people and Jewish practices during this time in first century Palestine. So let's come to an understanding by going back a little bit and understanding some history in the Bible as God presents in his word uh, so we can come back to this moment with a little bit more understanding. Now, what's really interesting to us is when we look in the book of Genesis, you would think, there we go. That's where we're going to find the beginning of fasting. I mean, we've got the great patriarchs, right? We've got Adam and, and we've got uh, Noah and we've got Abraham and we've got Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. And we don't have fasting as a religious practice. And certainly we know there was worship of God, and we know there was altars that were built, and we know there were grieving moments as well, uh, but we don't have fasting. We do have it when we come to Moses. And Moses gives us two examples of fasting that he did. All right, And both of those have to do with him when he was receiving the Ten Commandments. And he gives two examples. The first one is in Deuteronomy chapter 9. And then the second would be in Exodus uh, chapter 34. And we're going to start with Deuteronomy 9 first, because even though it comes later in the order of the books of the, the Pentateuch, he's actually referencing an earlier account. And what he's doing in this passage in Deuteronomy 9 is drawing back to the times when they had been rebellious to God. So he's going to be talking to them about when he first received the Ten Commandments, the ones that were with the finger of God, uh, painting them prior to the golden calf. And he says to them, remember, I'll start in verse 7, do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day that you departed from the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Also in Horeb, you provoked the Lord to wrath so that the Lord was angry enough with you to have destroyed you. When I went up into the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant which the Lord made with you, then I stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water. Then the Lord delivered to me two tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And on them were all the words which the Lord had spoken to you on the mountain from the midst of the fire in the day of the assembly. And then if we go over to Exodus chapter 34, we, we've just had the first account, the first tablets. In Exodus chapter 34, this is, of course, after the uh, events of the golden calf. He had just destroyed that. God's wrath had come down. Moses had pleaded with God. He's going to receive uh, the second set. And he says here, the Lord said to Moses, write these words, for according to the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. Verse 28 in Exodus 34. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. We have two examples. 
Twice Moses would have been on the mountain and fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights. Neither did he eat bread nor drink water. Surely miraculous things were taking place as he was in a very particular communion with God at a magnificent moment in the history of the world. Not just the Jewish people, but the world as God was present and giving his commandments that would shape the future of the world. And Moses was fasting in the midst of that. Now Moses didn't receive just the Ten Commandments at that moment. But he would receive all 600 uh, plus laws that would be part of the law of Moses, the covenant that he made with the, God made with the Hebrew people. And if we turn to Leviticus chapter 16 and in Leviticus uh, chapter 23, uh, you will see that he finally gives us the command, the command to fast. And both these accounts have to do with the Day of Atonement. Now, the Day of Atonement was, of course, an incredibly important moment, yearly moment for the Hebrew people. And it had uh, very specific instructions. And in Leviticus chapter 16, God's giving specific instructions for the high priest. It had to do with the, the young bull, the young ram, uh, the two uh, young goats that they had, what he was to wear, how he was to wash, how he was to perform all the various uh, exercises for the Day of Atonement. And in the midst of this, there is a command that is given that they should afflict their, their souls. Now, if you read with me in Leviticus 16, verses 29 through 31, this shall be a statute forever for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether a native of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. For on that day, the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean, clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, and you shall afflict your souls. It is a statute forever. In Leviticus chapter 23, as we continue on with these uh, Levitical expectations, it's, it's the list of the various feasts uh, that God has given for the uh, Israelites to perform. There would be the Passover feast, the Feast of the First Fruits. There would be the Feast of the Weeks, the Feast of the Trumpets. And then we come to the Day of Atonement. And as he's reminding them some things about the Day of Atonement, we get the repetition of that phrase once again, that you shall afflict your souls. In verses 26 and verses 20 through 28, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also, the tenth day of this seventh month shall be the Day of Atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you, and you shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the Day of Atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For any person who is not afflicted in his soul on that day shall be cut off from his people. Now you say, okay, afflict your souls. What is that? A fair question. The initial temptation might be, okay, well, here's what I feel like it means. And let's take a modern understanding of afflict your souls and then project that back on the text. That's an easy temptation, and you'll get all manner of interpretation that way. Dangerous. A much wiser move is to say, okay, where else can I find the use of that phrase in the Scriptures? And how can I allow these Scriptures to unfold and define these things for us? And in order to do that, we have to be mindful that some words are translated multiple ways in the King James, the New King James, ESV, and various things. So the word there, afflict, may also be translated as humble and your translation you're reading now. You can do an in-depth word search on that, and I would recommend you do that if you want to spend time in this. But we're going to move this on a little bit, and I'm going to show you some of the places uh, where it uses the word afflict in that translation. For example, Ezra chapter 8, verse 21, in the older King James Version, we find the use of afflict your souls, uh, that phrase. Again, in others it may say humble your souls, but it's the same thing. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might afflict ourselves before our God to seek of him a right way for us and for our little ones and for all uh, our substance. This is Ezra who's about to lead the people back to Jerusalem and they're going to afflict themselves, which would mean too fast, uh, in order uh, to appeal to God for safe travel, uh, to humble themselves before God as they make that move 
out of exile and going back to uh, Jerusalem. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 3, we find uh, a very similar phrase. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure, and exact all your labors. Again, connecting afflicting your souls with fasting. And surely in Psalm chapter 35, verse 13, this time ESV, but I... When they were sick, I wore sackcloth. I afflicted myself with fasting. I prayed uh, with head bowed on my chest. You can speak in, uh, to various rabbis, and you can actually look through the rabbinical literature, and you will find quite a lengthy explanation of uh, the connection between these verses and explanation of afflicting the souls. And even in the New Testament, when we find the Day of Atonement about and, and Paul's on his way to Rome on the ship, he makes a reference to the fast. The point being that the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, would always have been associated with a fast. And it was a command of God to fast for the Day of Atonement. That's where we get the command for it. And this would have been in the Hebrews people's minds. Fasting associated with the Day of Atonement. It is a command to focus ourselves, to devote ourselves with great intensity towards God and what God would be doing for us and to draw closer to Him. But fasting isn't limited to just the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament. To be sure, there's plenty of other examples of fasting in the Old Testament. King David. King David was so convicted of the sin that he had committed with Bathsheba. He was so convicted of the consequences of his sin that the son that they were to have together in this uh, illegitimate relationship, uh, coming together because of lust and sin and murder and lies, that God was going to take the child. He is overwhelmed with grief and mourning, and he is caught up in an incredible amount of fasting. In verse 16 of 2 Samuel chapter 12, David therefore pleaded with God for the child, and David fasted. And he went in and lay all night on the ground. And of course his servants would come in and they would speak to him and plead with him to get up, and he would have nothing to do with it. He wouldn't eat for seven days. And they were scared to tell him when the child had passed because they thought, well, what harm could he bring to himself? But he knew something was up. He perceived it. Uh... And so he asked him, is the child dead? Uh, in verse 19, and they said, he is dead. And then verse 20, David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself. He changed his clothes and he went into the house of the Lord and he worshiped. Then he went to his own house. And when he requested, they set food before him and he ate. With great mourning and grief, David was brought to fasting. That may feel familiar those of you that have been in tremendous grief and mourning, how hungry were you in the midst of that? Probably and quite usually not very much. It's easy to understand the fasting when overcome with such grief and mourning, especially when you're so responsible for the loss of that child. King Jehoshaphat would be another one that would fast. Now, you may not be as familiar with King Jehoshaphat as you would be with King David, but he was, I believe, the fourth king of Judah during the time period of the divided kingdom. And he had an incredible problem. He was beset beside, on all sides by the Ammonites and the Moabites. And they were going to descend in and conquer his people. And he knew his military force was not strong enough to repel them. And so he knew with great anxiety that he had to plead to God. And so what he did was call out for all of Judah an entire nation to fast and to go to God in prayer that he would deliver them. And so he would in quite an amazing and miraculous way. It's an incredible account of uh, God protecting his people in Second Chronicles chapter 20 uh, in verse 3 is where he is described as fasting. And there's other fasting as well. You remember the story of Jonah when he comes out of the belly of the great fish and he goes into Nineveh and he proclaims that God will have mercy on them if they will repent. And they listen to his message and they sit in sackcloth and ash and they fast. They fast looking for God's mercy and for hope. Ezra, as we talked about previously in Ezra chapter 8 and verse 21, he is humble and coming before the Lord 
Uh, he does not want to go depend on provisions uh, for the king that he's leaving, but his trust is certainly in God, and they fast before they go to God in prayer. Esther, of course, the amazing story of Esther in which uh, wicked people are turned against the Jewish people and they're going to oppress them and call for their death. And the one who can do something about it, the one person who can, who can perhaps turn the mind of the king, though it's very dangerous and her life is at risk, she calls for a fast and for prayer. And so those of her and her servants and all the Jewish people that are in Shushan, they fast for three days. Daniel, the great, great man Daniel, he fasts in Daniel chapter 9, verses 2 and 3. Daniel's going in, it tells us, and he's considering the words of Jeremiah, how Jeremiah talks about the um, terrible things that are coming uh, and have come uh, to the uh, Hebrew nation and the 70 years of captivity. And he prepares to seek God uh, to focus with great intensity, and he begins that with fasting as he searches through the Scriptures. There we have it in the Old Testament, a considerable amount, and there's other fasting as well. The fasting occur occurs, of course, for worship because of the Day of Atonement as God had commanded. But it also occurs uh, for reasons of grief and mourning, for anxiety, for humility, for hope, and for focus. But in all of these, it's situations in which people find themselves needing to draw closer to God with great determination, with great intensity, with great focus for whatever their situation, they are coming to approach God and almost always with prayer. Now, that's a helpful thing for us to go back and examine because as we come back around to the Sermon on the Mount, now we have a context for why Jesus is saying the things that he's saying. Because when he, these people are hearing him talking about fasting, well, they certainly understand fasting as a command for the Day of Atonement. And they certainly understand fasting as a practice to deal with anxiety and um, uh, hope and uh, for pleading to God. These would have been practices. But they also would have been aware of fasting as a religious ritual to elevate yourself as a spiritual person and Jesus is condemning that at that particular moment. You don't do this for men. You don't do it for the sake of fasting. It's going to be done in a correct way, not to elevate yourself, but to draw yourself closer to God. It's between you and God. And certainly we would see this happen with Jesus and his disciples. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 and 15, we have this moment in which the disciples of John are approaching Jesus and they're asking, okay, we fast and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast as we do. They have questions about fasting. And it's good to be able to ask Jesus questions. And so Jesus is going to answer them in the question and he tells them, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. You see, the disciples that were with Jesus were with Jesus. Their spiritual needs were being met in a way that we can only dream about. They were directly hearing the words of Jesus, seeing the miracles of Jesus, walking beside Jesus, eating with Jesus. And if they had questions, Jesus was there to answer them. And if they had needs, Jesus was there to take care of them, as he did over and over and over again. Even when they were having real struggles with who he was and how they should follow him, he would be there and graciously lift them up. They would ask him how to pray, and he would tell them how to pray. How to increase their faith, they wouldn't do that. When they needed correcting, he was there to do that. You want to sit at my right and left hand? You don't know what you're asking. Let me explain this to you. You want to call down fire from above to destroy the city? You need to stop and kind of understand really what we're trying to do here, which is seek and save the lost. Sure, they were with Jesus. He was saying they don't need to feast. But there will come a time, uh, they don't need to fast, but there will come a time well, they will most certainly need to fast, want to fast, benefit from fasting. We skip on ahead to uh, the church in Antioch, which is, of course, one of my favorite uh, congregations uh, in the New Testament. In Acts chapter 13, they have this incredible thing about to unfold. We're about to see Paul and Barnabas go out on the first missionary journey. 
Now, what an incredible task that would be. And they would be planning congregations and building up congregations. Uh, they would be confronting uh, unbelief and paganism, and, and they would be reaching out to the Gentiles. This was no small thing that they were about to partake in. And so in Acts chapter 13, now in the church that was at Antioch, in verse 1, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius, the Cyrene, Menaean, who was uh, brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. The Holy Spirit said, now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. It was a big moment. It required focus, intense determination, and drawing closer to God in order to make these decisions. So they prayed and they fasted. It's an example of where they're doing this together for a particular purpose. Acts chapter 14, 21 through 23, you would see again them fasting for another incredible moment. At that point, they've started in their journey, but now they are establishing leadership as God would instruct them to do in the local congregations. And so they would fast and they would pray as they were installing elders in the congregations. What an incredible moment to take place. And so now we have a little bit clearer picture. Yeah, Jesus fasted at a moment of great transition in his ministry and preparation for facing the temptations of the devil. And yes, Jesus taught about fasting to a Jewish people talking about uh, what they would understand as fasting and how not to fast. And yes, we see that the disciples surely fasted at very particular times. But we have this question, okay, I got that. How often should a Christian fast? for religious reasons, to please God, to approach God. Well, there's not a specific thing. Uh, I can't give you a number of days. I can't give you a number of times because the Bible does not say these things. There's not a particular festival for us to say we should fast under. There's no longer a day of atonement for us to follow. Hebrews 10.10 says Jesus died once for all. Hebrews establishes the fact that Jesus is the high priest, that Jesus is the sacrifice. We're no longer under the old covenant. And so the commandments that would apply to the day of atonement would no longer apply to us. So how often should I fast? Well, when you need extra focus on God's will, that would be a really important time you might fast. It's not required. It's not required by God. We have no specific command for it. There's no uh, instruction to specifically do that. But we can see what we have outside of the Day of Atonement, which we're no longer under. There were moments where the practice connected in the right way, with the right heart, with the right attitude, with the right purpose, would help us focus on God and drawing closer to Him. You see, in fasting, the restriction that we give is a part of self-discipline. And I'm sure this is a topic we do not talk about often enough. We do have tables filled of immense amounts of food, and we often hear, you pile that food up on that plate, and then on top of that, you better finish that meal. And that's a fun thing to do, right? We have some amazing cooks in our churches and our fellowship meals. We are blessed, for sure. But there are times in which you need to learn to discipline yourselves and cut back. And especially in those moments where you're trying to discern the will of God. Especially in those moments where great decisions need to be made. It is okay to fast. But remember to do it in the way that Jesus instructed. It is not to elevate yourself as a highly spiritual person for people to point out and say, that guy's fasting. It's not something you're wanting to put on your social media account, hashtag fasting, 40 days and 40 nights, wrong purpose. Wrong purpose immensely. The purpose of the fasting was usually joined with the prayer and with the need for hope and focus and to overcome the anxieties for these forces raining down on top of you in order to make decisions that would be pleasing to God that may be very difficult decisions, such as 
going on missionary journeys and such as installing leadership. These were big moments in the life of the church. They required intense determination. I think we would benefit greatly if we would approach our decisions with that level of determination. Not for the sake of fasting, because fasting for its own sake is pointless. It's a ritual. But with the determination to please God and set aside distractions and fully commit ourselves in a way that would please Him, spending time in the Word, spending time in prayer, spending time with an absolute determination to live for Him and to please Him, well, fasting might benefit us in that regard. Not sinful in and of itself, but be careful. Be very careful. And if you do decide to do it, be smart about it. If you've never fasted before, you might want to start a smaller amount of time period. And if you decide to go to a longer period of time, you need to ask yourself, why am I doing that? And have I talked to a physician to make sure that's safe for me? There's not a thing wrong with that. But we don't need to profess this loudly that we are those kinds of people. And we don't need to participate in fasting festivals um, as if it's a novelty. It was a pretty serious matter. And it is something that may benefit us as a discipline. We won't disregard it, but it's not required. And when you need that extra focus on God's will, it may be something that you decide to do, and it could help you. If you have other questions about that, or where you'd like to know some more details about how to fast in a better way, we'll be glad to talk to you about that. We are so grateful that you could be here with us tonight and asking for a friend, uh, and we can't wait to talk to you in the coming weeks. If you have any comments or questions, there's going to be information on how to get in touch with us through telephone, through email, and through our website. We would love to hear with you, uh, hear from you, and talk to you in the future. Thanks so much, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Let us pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the power of your word. And Father, we acknowledge that we need the every hour of our life. Help us, Father, as we approach your great throne to focus on you, to lay aside every way that might beset us, to strive, Father, to be pleasing to you in our heart. And Father, let us be genuine. Father, there are so many struggles that men are having now. Father, we, we struggle. We struggle with life itself. We struggle with the loss of loved ones. We struggle with others who have problems with their health and even our own selves. Sometimes, Father, we struggle with not understanding why things happen, and why things happen the way they do and to the people we know and love. And, Father, we pray for those who have lost and loved ones and are struggling with missing them so much. And Father, as we approach you tonight before we close this service, we meditate upon your word and the lesson and let us meditate on the lesson that we've heard tonight. Because Father, we do need you and we acknowledge this and we praise you. Father, when we are weak, you are strong and you can make us strong. And let us find the strength to always reach out to you and then to reach out to others. Father, we love you so much. And Father, let us reflect that love to others. Thank you, Father, for your patience with us, your understanding. Father, sometimes we just don't know what to say. 
Help us in our hearts to reach out to you. And things that are hard to speak, let us reach out in faith, in love, and you'll understand, Father. And we pray that when that time comes, you'll be able to say to us, well done, faithful servant. Be with us now, Father. Go with us. Be with those who are listening by live stream. Be with our preachers. Be with our teachers. Be with us, Father, not just when we're strong, but be with us, Father, as you know we will be in those times of weakness. Let us just be your humble servants. We ask these things in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen.